a vu ce matin euh, grâce euh, à Nigel sur le cas du gouvernement euh, au Royaume-Uni. Ce mouvement est relativement présent et tend à se répondre euh, aux démocraties euh, occidentales. Le libre accès aux données publiques soulève des questions naturellement d'ordre légal, économique, technologique et politique. Et pour partager cette vision d'ensemble sur l'open data, j'invite le modérateur de ce panel, François Vancillon, directeur exécutif de l'initiative Service mobile de l'INRA, à me rejoindre et il va inviter les cinq panélistes de cette discussion. Merci. Euh, bonjour, j'invite les panélistes à venir s'installer. Euh, donc j'ai demandé à plein de gens s'il fallait parler français ou anglais. Euh, on m'a suggéré de parler français, donc je vais. I, so I will switch to English. Uh, uh, so uh, it's my pleasure to be here uh, talking about uh, um, open data. Uh, my name is François Vancillon. I'm with uh, uh, Inria, running a program named uh, Mobile Services Initiative, and with a company named Data Publica, which is an open data uh, company. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, before I introduce the speakers, let me say a few things about what uh, I believe open data is. Uh, the, the main idea of open data is uh, that the public data, uh, which means uh, the one that has been gathered, maintained, and used by public organization, actually uh, should be made available for, uh, <clears throat> bonjour Bernard, Uh, should be made available for uh, reuse and uh, access by both uh, citizens and uh, organizations. Uh, we'll be talking about that issue. Uh, open data was started um, in 2009 by uh, the Obama administration. Uh, if I go back, uh, I, my, my conjecture is that the first <coughs> actual occurrence of open data uh, in mankind is, happened in the Garden of Eden. Uh, so, so God actually uh, put the Garden of Eden together and put Adam and Eve in there. And he tells them, um, you can do whatever you want, but there's this tree there, which is the tree of knowledge, and, and you should not approach it. Uh, so Adam is, Adam is actually a big dumb guy, and, and he just uh, uh, does what, what he's been told. And Eve, who's a smart woman, uh, is interested because that's the tree of knowledge. So she goes there and picks an apple, which is actually the first uh, open data access. The snake idea is just a, a Hollywood uh, catch added on the story, which doesn't bring anything any much. Uh, so the end, the end result is that they get kicked out of uh, the Garden of Eden, uh, which is actually a very positive thing, because uh, the Garden of Eden is actually a, a fairly boring place, uh, like a giant club med where where you stay forever, and being thrown out of there means that you go back to life, and it shows what uh, women uh, brought to mankind. Okay, so to talk about those issues, uh, we have the pleasure of having uh, Bernard Benamou, who is a uh, <coughs> ministerial delegate at uh, Internet Usage. Uh, Bernard set up a, a very exciting and interesting program, which is called Proxima Mobile, which deals with uh, mobile services, And he recently set up a, a call for a project around, uh, <coughs> uh, around mobility and uh, open data, and he'll, he'll talk about it. Uh, so Katarzyna uh, Janika Pavlovska is uh, with the legal office and represents the EEC. Uh, so she's a um, legal officer in Access for, to Information Unit in the European Commission, responsible to the Directive on Reuse and public uh, sector information. So she, she'll bring the point of view of Europe and, uh, and uh, what happens there. Uh, Fabien Gandon uh, is with INRIA. He's a recognized leader in um, uh, <coughs> semantic web research. Uh, he's part of a, 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 a fairly big uh, research program which is called Data Lift. And he's also associated with the W3C and he'll bring the point of view of um, Uh, technology uh, and uh, the W3C point of view. Uh, Romain Lacombe. Uh, Romain Lacombe is with Etalab. Etalab is the French organization that is 
putting in place uh, data.gov.fr inference. He's in charge of innovation there. <clears throat> and he will give you the, uh, we hope, the official word about uh, what's happening there. Uh, and then uh, Bruno Walter uh, is uh, the CEO of uh, Captain Dash, uh, <clears throat> which is a highly innovative uh, startup uh, that's bringing solution to integrate uh, internal and external data for uh, in a dashboard for uh, companies. Uh, according to his uh, 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 Twitter uh, thread, he spends his life uh, flying between uh, um, between uh, Tunisia and France, and uh, we're lucky to have him because he got stuck there. Okay, so uh, <clears throat> I will uh, give each each of the speakers uh, something like five minutes to talk. Uh, you can either uh, speak from your uh, from where you are, or join me at the desk. That's a choice, uh, and I will uh, start with uh, Bernard and um, ask him uh, what is the importance of uh, open data in mobile application, and why did you base your last call for proposal on uh, uh, with the two themes of uh, Europe and open data? Thanks, Francois, and sorry to be a little late. Um, thanks to you all. Um, mobility will be, for us, uh, the very first customer of uh, open data in the next future, uh, in the near future. Uh, basically, what we are trying to do, and you kindly mentioned the, the portal Proxima Mobile, which has been the first European portal of mobile services for citizens, launched more than one and a half year ago. Uh, we've been trying to leverage three of the wealth of European countries, and especially France, First, we have an integrated market of mobility, which is among the strongest in the world. Even if we compare, indeed, with China, there, are, there is almost one billion users of mobile in China, but the middle income is completely different between Europe and China, and even, strangely, between Europe and the US for the global mobility market. First. Second, we have data. We have data, and I will try to be a little bit, bit more precise uh, of three different kinds, but basically cultural data, touristic data, um, transport information, um, env environmental information, sustainable uh, development information and so on. We have data which is among the most, co uh, 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 the most asked, the most wanted in the world. For example, one of the services we uh, financed in Proxima Mobile is the service of the Louvre, Museum of the Louvre, which is indeed one of the most downloaded mobile services in the world, and which, is, uh, which has been um, downloaded four million times and 60% in the US. Basically, we have a treasure of data, which is the, the gold mine for the near future of mobile services. Either open data or global data, generated by European citizens and organizations. And last but not least, we have brains. We have a lot of good and very well-trained brains. The problem is, at this moment, they don't find uh, the possibility to express their talents uh, on the European soil. We want them to stay here. We love California, but we love our brains here. And we want to be sure that they have a European-wide market to express their talents. We want, and that's why we created that um, open data European uh, call for project that you mentioned, uh, for mobile services using European-wide data. Uh, it's because we want them to experience and to experiment their talent on a global basis for European-wide services, not on local services only, even if uh, open data can be used for very local or very global services. We have been uh, creating an uh, application for the G8, G20, because France is the presidency, as the presidency now, and we have been using large sets, data sets of data, your, uh, economic, demographic, uh, and, and many others, but we want also to be sure that between the very large sets of data and the very local ones, there is the possibility to develop services on a multi-country basis. 
not on a local one. And that's precisely why we are so interested in the use of data on mobile, because the data on mobile can be threefold. First, open data as we know it, uh, public-based information. Second, and that's not the least, and that's what we mentioned during the call for project you, you attended, um, ge um, data generated by companies. And there is a lot of convergence between data produced by public entities and data produced by societies, NGOs, and so on. And also, data produced by citizens themselves, crowdsourcing information. That's the convergence between the three that will be for us the key for value creation and service creation in the near future. I didn't want to be too long. Thank you, Bernard. Um, <clears throat> uh, let me turn to uh, Fabien. Fabien, you're in charge of um, um, research. Could you tell us a little bit what, what are the key R&D research issue in there? And why is the W3C interested in that topic? Thank you, Francois. So uh, since Thomas Rosler from W3C couldn't be here, and since as a researcher at INRI, I'm also part of W3C, I'm gonna try to uh, wear both hats here today. Um, so um, first of all, for me, um, open data needs open format, okay? Uh, to be stored, to be exchanged like XML, and in that sense, we have a need for neutral body, standardization body like W3C, uh, to design and publish uh, these formats. And now in parallel, from a research point of view, uh, these data sets opened uh, on the web, their variety, their content, uh, their uh, life cycle, uh, their usage, they called for research to develop efficient means of communication, parsing, uh, storage, access, you name it, transformation, security, interna internationalization of this um, data. Open data also needs open data structures. Um, so for instance, um, RDF is a standard uh, which is inherently open and it, which is used in uh, the linked open data initiative. And it's a, not only a non-proprietary um, model and a non-proprietary syntax, it is also designed uh, to make the data set extensible. Uh, by design, RDF model ensures that anyone can say anything about anything. That is, as soon as I give a name to something, someone can reuse that name and attach his or her data to it. So it's inherently um, opened. Now from a research perspective, this creates very big challenges. Um, for instance, calculating on uh, open data in an open world assumption is, is difficult. Um, I can never be sure I have all the data I should have. Uh, I cannot derive uh, anything from the fact a piece of data is missing because it's maybe out there but I haven't found it yet. So as soon uh, as you do that, many problems arise and um, research questions such as uh, what kind of processing can be done in that uh, circumstance, and ultimately, how can I find my way uh, through this uh, giant global graph of uh, open data? Open data also needs open protocols um, to be accessible to everyone everywhere. But uh, hold on a minute, uh, is it really what I want? Um, open data is sometimes I, um, reduced to data which is pu publicly readable. Uh, but this tends to be a bit more complex in practice. Um, we may need to uh, have more than the read access. We may want the full crude operation, crude standing for create open data, I want to be able to add my open data, read open data, okay, update, I want to be able to change the open data I've, I've, I've contributed to, and delete for instance, if I want to be able to implement the right to oblivion. And so standardization again, like uh, Sparkle 1.1, for instance, is going in that direction, but many hard problem remains here again. For instance, temporality. Um, in this accesses to data, uh, what happens when the data changes? And what, how can I control the chain reaction I trigger in the open graph of open data when I change something? And, um, the open access needs also to be secure, uh, and, and, and you'd also need to attach um, licenses and right access to the data. Um, if I have data, I might want to open some part of it, okay, but not all the whole data. Many people, for the time being, they, they don't open that data because part of it, they don't want to open it, but they could open the rest. Can I have that? And as paradoxical as it may seem, 
uh, the absence of license may eventually restrict the use of open data by making difficult to identify exactly which data are opened. And, and so even, even when I get the access to the data, uh, I, I may want to make sure where it comes from, the provenance, the traceability, the authenticity in an open world before I do anything with them. In that context, there are many uh, complex questions again uh, from a research perspective. Uh, what happens when I mash up data with different provenances and listen, licenses? What are uh, the provenances I should attach to the result of my calculation when I mix things, for instance. What can I do with this result? Open data also need open schemas uh, in order to explain what the data is about, what, what exactly is the meaning of uh, this data. Uh, so here again, we have standardization work like RDFS and all that allows us to release the schemas of the data we are actually publishing. Uh, and this also needs uh, to be pushed further uh, we need to foster the emergence and stabilization of uh, standard schemes uh, and schemas in the domain of application. So if I'm working with biologists, I need to help them come up with their schema and publish them. But on top of it, let's not forget the open nature and the schema uh, open on, on the uh, open data world, uh, they open new uh, challenges such as uh, scaling. How do I scale on such huge amount of data? But also working with approximation, incomplete, or incoherent uh, data, which I, I am bound to find in an open world. So from a standardization point of view, uh, it's clear that we need to have ne neutral places where to build such standards to open the data, including open architecture, open formats, open languages, and open protocols, but also open methodologies, because these technologies are so complex. We need also to open the methodology to use them. And now I'd like to conclude with two last points from, from an academic point perspective. Uh, first of all, with the web and, and beyond computer science, many academic disciplines face new research and education challenges. And the Open Data Initiative in itself uh, covers uh, several of uh, them, from le legal issues to uh, new economic uh, models to be invented, from so sociological uh, approaches to the open data life cycle to a biological model that can inspire a new data structure and algorithm. And finally, there is a reciprocal perspective to be taken from the academic point of view. Uh, since science and education produce and consume a fair amount, of, a fair amount of data themselves, so academia is an application domain itself of open data. For instance, there is a need for more open science data initiative, opening up observation and results of scientific activities to other scientists to analyze and reuse, making academic and research material one click away from being reuseful. In other words, we need um, an open academic world needs open data. Merci Fabien. I now turn to Romain Lacombe. Uh, Romain, what are the plans for uh, Etalab to open data in France? You want to do it here? Easier, so I'll, I'll uh, try to be brief. Dear François, Mesdames et Messieurs, dear Bernard, um, Etalab is the French government's um, open data project. And so we tend to think uh, of open data not only as a technological advance, uh, but as a powerful public policy tool, um, a tool that's both a democratic imperative, but which also should contribute to economic development um, and should help strengthen transparency in government. So French, France sorry, has embarked uh, with uh, Etalab on an um, am ambitious open data policy, as has uh, Great Britain, for example, with uh, Professor Shadbolt, who um, talked this morning about data.gov.uk. And our vision um, of open data is that it will grant citizens access to core information on our nation, from public finances, uh, the quality of our air, the, the performance of our jobs market, and this transparency increases the accountability of public services. Um, it also brings government closer to citizens and uh, the idea of direct evaluation of uh, public services sorry, by um, the citizens themselves, uh, if this works, yeah, uh, is b basically something that helps strengthen the trust um, in which we all hold our public institution institutions so as, as such, open data can uh, nourish the public debate. Uh, it can promote equal opportunities for all, 
And uh, more than um, a democratic imperative, it is also a tool for uh, economic development. So in a, a speech uh, last week on, on tomorrow's growth, uh, the prime minister, um, I quote, said, returns to transparency are also economic in nature and broadening free access to data held by the government strengthens entrepreneurs' trust in public institutions, which is an essential factor of economic development. Uh, so easy and free use of open government data is important for the competitiveness of uh, France's businesses, and especially, of course, for the digital economy. Um, open data can work only with uh, developers, entrepreneurs, startup founders, uh, inventing a second life to this data. It can support scientific research, it can support sustainable development with applications such as um, smart multimodal information or uh, crowdsourced uh, uh, um, information for uh, relief efforts. Um, be beyond this, France uh, has tried on this basis to adopt a key principle for public sector information reuse, uh, which is broad access and free reuse as widely as possible. So this was created by a uh, executive order on May 26th. This is very uh, uh, recent. And uh, along that circle came a decree which strictly re restrains the possibility of creating a, uh, a charging scheme for data reuse. Uh, it is still possible, but it will be possible only for exceptional circumstances. And the objective, of course, is to encourage data reuse and encourage new applications of this data. Uh, so since February and the creation of Etalab, I've been uh, lucky enough to work on uh, innovation at Etalab. And Etalab is um, the mission under the Prime Minister's authority uh, that's tasked with opening and enabling open data in France. Uh, it is headed by Séverin Naudet, which, who's the, uh, the former internet advisor to the Prime Minister and was an executive at Dailymotion uh, before that. And Etalab coordinates online publication of uh, government data from all ministerial departments. So one coordinator has been appointed in each and every department, uh, and their goal is to make uh, this data available online through uh, the open data platform Etalab is building, data.gov.fr, and to publish it as extensively as possible in raw, uh, machine-readable formats. Uh, talking about formats during uh, August's uh, last Council of Ministers, uh, Valérie Pécresse, who's the uh, uh, spokeswoman for the French government, uh, reminded all the other ministers of the importance of open data and called, uh, I quote, uh, to generalize the use of free and open formats so as to encourage public data reuse. Uh, to lead this mission, Etarab has chosen an open uh, approach and for example, we've been organizing frequent, frequent uh, workshops that are open to all uh, and that have allowed us to leverage the experience uh, of the, uh, the community, the open data community, the developers, the, the entrepreneurs uh, working on this. And uh, we've had the participation of experts such as uh, Francois uh, to help build this conversation around open data. So uh, for that matter, I can only invite you to uh, follow us on Twitter at uh, Etalab. Uh, or to read our blog, right? blog.etalab.gouv.fr. Um, and to talk a little bit, uh, to conclude, uh, and to talk about uh, data.gouv.fr, that uh, open data platform we're building, uh, it is basically framed as a search engine for uh, public data sets. Uh, and the, the aim is to allow direct download of the raw data sets. It is built on an uh, open source uh, CMS and with a search and semantic technologies from uh, French startups. It will be uh, released in, in December as a first beta version, and, and the goal is then to uh, incrementally and in somehow perpetual beta uh, make it evolve uh, so as to always uh, steadily improve and meet the expectations of data reusers. Um, the long-term vision, of course, is that uh, data.gouv.fr should, uh, by publishing PSI in row, uh, open, machine-readable formats uh, paved the way for linked uh, open data in the future. So, so these were the main uh, points I wanted to, to share with you today. Um, Etalab's uh, mission and data.gouv.fr's mission of uh, opening the French government's data is, of course, something that can uh, only work as a conversation. Uh, 
a conversation between the community of reusers and uh, data producers in the administration. So let that uh, conversation thrive. Thank you. Merci, Romain. Uh, Nigel Shadbolt, who uh, had the kindness to accept to sit on this, uh, 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 on this panel. Uh, for those of you who came late, Nigel gave a, a, a keynote speech this morning. Uh, uh, Nigel was one of the instrumental uh, maker, together with uh, Tim Berners-Lee of uh, data.gov.uk. Nigel, what advice would you give Romain to catch up with the Brits? <laughs> well, look, I tell you what, a, a race always helps uh, because actually uh, everybody is a race to the top, okay? And actually, that, that's great. Um, I don't, we've, we, we've spoken um, with uh, Severin, uh, team and uh, actually I think the advice is to just go out there and find out what communities want are doing that's happening you know the open discussions that are happening really crucial um, I would suggest that we all make uh, we all have our own local problems so no one open data project in any particular region or city or uh, country looks quite the same. It has many of the same principles, but there'll be some really bizarre reason why one set of data is impossible to get out in one particular jurisdiction and very straightforward in another. I think one of the very powerful things that has happened in the French work to date is this really strong commitment to forego unless there are extreme conditions, and we'll see how that works out, charging for public data if it's collected for a public purpose. In the UK in the past, we've developed a rather mixed economy of agencies who are asked to cover their costs or even return a dividend to government. They're in government, but they're asked to return a dividend to government by charging for, for data. Now, in some cases, one can make quite an interesting case for why that might be required, because there is a high cost to collecting some of this information, but in many cases we want to set the barrier very high to say the assumption should be that if it's collected for the public purpose with taxpayers' money, then why do we have to pay for it twice, okay? Um, but one would look at all these individual examples, and I think it's really interesting to compare and contrast. The other interesting thing is the extent to which in some countries the cities, the urban centers have been taking the lead because cities, urban centers have lots of their own control over data as is clearly here the case in Paris. Same in London, Vancouver, Washington. There are very natural reasons why cities can be a, a crystallization point for data, open data efforts. And then I think the key thing is to try and integrate the local with the central efforts. Um, and, of course, human nature being what it is, there'll be a kind of a race there, too, uh, which is not always a bad thing. I think a final thing I would say is the missing part of all of this is business. Now, business thinks it's a great idea to use public data, if it's open, to add value to, and that's a really important thing to do because it helps generate the economic argument. But I think business has got to stop thinking about whether it shouldn't be more routinely making more of its data openly available. And the data hugging go goes on in government is just as prevalent in companies. And often, if the companies would release it, they'd make a lot more out of it. It would do more for them. One thing is that, I mean, Amazon's a great example. It releases most of its data, um, a lot of it, and it has thousands and thousands of application developers building applications for it that it doesn't have to... Um, um, uh, pay for it itself. Supply chains, logistics, open supply chain data so that people can connect. And I think we understand this in some cases in industry, but I think there's much more we could do there. So getting business to think about the opportunities of open. And where that becomes really important for government is when, of course, you take a public service and you outsource it to the private uh, sector. Now, here we've learned the hard way in the UK that unless you think at the point at which you procure that service about the data, you will lose access to it. And so when you procure services 
I think it's very important for the government or the region or the city to say, you know what, yeah, we'll give you the right to develop the service, but actually the underlying core data should stay in public ownership. If you add new value, if you add your own an analytics and data sets, sure you can charge for it, but let's keep the playing field level at the, at the bottom. Thank you. Um, and I'm glad you pointed the uh, issue of uh, business, so I can turn to uh, uh, Bruno. Bruno, you know the world of uh, uh, startups, and uh, you run a startup. What, what does open data mean for a uh, uh, technology company in general, and for Captain Dash in particular? Uh, I think the... Je suis désolé, je vais switcher en français, mais le, le, les deux enjeux majeurs de l'open data quand on commence à le manipuler, euh, et c'est ce qu'on fait sur Captain Dash, où on permet à des entreprises, on collecte les données internes de l'entreprise provenant de leur ERP, on, connecte, on collecte les données de l'entreprise élargie, venant de Google, de Facebook, et ainsi de suite, et on l'enrichit d'énormément de données euh, qu'on va trouver euh, un peu partout euh, sur la toile en open data pour tout simplement comprendre ce qui explique les les phénomènes d'achat, et on va par exemple intégrer dans des systèmes de business intelligence traditionnels de la météo, des résultats électoraux, que sais-je. Et en fait, on s'aperçoit très vite qu'on est confronté à un énorme problème qui s'appelle la big data. Et si vous ne réglez pas le problème de la big data, vous n'arrivez pas à profiter de la quintessence de l'open data. C'est-à-dire qu'on est obligé de travailler sur des solutions no SQL, avec des vraies difficultés, c'est qu'on traite du no SQL, mais on est quand même obligé de traiter plein de dimensions sur le NoSQL et les jointures sont un peu limitées, donc il faut quand même par moment qu'on refasse des traitements et qu'on refasse des cubes au-dessus. Donc en fait, même si le sujet de l'open data a l'air, j'allais dire, peu technophile, enfin, on a l'impression souvent qu'il suffit de mettre en ligne des données, on s'aperçoit que derrière, quand on veut les utiliser, on est face à quasiment un mur quantique dans la donnée et on a certains clients sur lesquels on fait des traitements où l'unité de calcul est en pétadonnée. Euh, ce qui sur des formats traditionnels est un peu compliqué donc ce que je veux dire c'est que d'un point de vue technologique l'open data implique deux choses nos SQL d'un côté et le cloud d'autre part parce que vous n'avez pas d'autre solution l'autre issue c'est qu'une fois que vous avez collecté des milliards de données comment vous véhiculez à l'intérieur de ces données comment vous leur donnez du sens comment vous traitez l'ergonomie de ces données et, parce que c'est extraordinairement difficile on voit bien qu'iTunes a réglé un peu le problème dans l'univers de la musique Mais la musique c'est un format assez simple vous avez, vous avez des titres d'albums, des trucs sur des, comment vous véhiculez dans des données, comment vous retrouvez les données et comment vous leur donnez vie. Surtout que s'il y a un endroit où la science a été feignante, c'est précisément la visualisation de données. Dites-vous simplement, quand vous utilisez Excel, les formats qu'on utilise, vous savez, les camemberts, les bar charts, euh, les lines et tout, c'est des trucs qui ont été inventés il y a deux ou trois siècles, et la contingence technique, c'était le compas, l'équerre et la règle. C'est pour ça que tous les sets de visualisation qu'on voit aujourd'hui, du compas dans un monde où on a tous des écrans, des tactiles, on peut utiliser de la 3D, de la 2D, de la... on peut imaginer plein de choses et plein de chemins de représentation qui sont très différentes. Et ne serait-ce que par exemple quand vous prenez vos jeux de données, aujourd'hui Google ou Bing nous permettent de, de jouer dans les systèmes de cartographie et par exemple de modifier les fonctions X, Y, Z et la hauteur de la carte pour avoir d'autres représentations de l'espace. Mais c'est qu'un petit exemple, donc on a devant nous un champ d'expérimentation majeur où on va devoir réinventer une nouvelle grammaire et une nouvelle manière de lire les données à travers des interfaces riches, à travers de la data visualisation, à travers ça. Donc c'est un champ qui est formidable. Et le dernier point pour rebondir sur les, les éléments de business, c'est qu'on voit aujourd'hui la majorité de nos clients qui se posent des questions très fondamentales sur est-ce que la libération de données n'est pas mon meilleur atout contre en particulier les Mac distributeurs. On a par exemple un client qui est un, un des géants de l'alimentation dans le monde qui se dit en fait, mes produits sont plutôt propres, je suis plutôt fier d'eux, je suis plutôt fier de la manière dont je le fais. Pourquoi je ne libérerai pas complètement les données de mes produits quand je sais que les marques des distributeurs, euh, les marques à bas prix, vont avoir beaucoup plus de mal à le faire parce que les éléments qu'ils mettent dedans, les endroits où c'est fabriqué, c'est beaucoup plus difficile et c'est beaucoup plus discutable. Donc ce que je veux dire, c'est que l'open data, c'est pas seulement un truc qui est en train de réinventer totalement la business intelligente, la manière dont on se comporte dans les organisations, c'est aussi quelque chose qui va créer formidablement de la richesse et vous verrez probablement que dans 4 à 5 ans, en termes de marketing, en termes de communication publicitaire et ainsi de suite, les marques qui auront libéré de la donnée, ce sera à peu près aussi important et aussi massif qu'une entreprise aujourd'hui qui ne respecterait pas la responsabilité sociale d'entreprise. Et on va voir des trucs très bizarres arriver, comme aujourd'hui quand vous achetez une canette de Coca-Cola, il y a le nombre de calories et il y a les apports journaliers qui sont marqués, ça vous paraît évident, 
Je vous assure que mettez-vous 40 ans en arrière et allez expliquer à Coca-Cola que ce serait sympa de mettre les calories sur la bouteille, c'est juste inconcevable. Donc la donnée est en vraiment en train de changer, enfin l'open data, de changer la manière dont on pense les systèmes, dont on vit les organisations et dont on, on pense l'informatique. Merci Bruno. Um, last but not least, we turn to uh, Katarzyna, who is going to give us the European perspective. Uh, why, Katarzyna, why should the EU be concerned by the um, um, open data and uh, what are the plans and the ongoing actions there? Thank you, Francois. Um, the European Commission is very serious about open data. Why we bother? Well, open data is growth and innovation. It's a raw material for the production of new services and new products in a cross-border context. It's about digital single market. Of course we bother. We have prepared the Commission strategy on open data. It's um, a package of ambitious initiatives composed of regulatory measures and deployment actions. Um, the Vice President of the European Commission, Nelly Cross, will propose this uh, package to her colleagues at the end of November. Um, now about um, regulatory measures. This is mainly revision of directive on the reuse of public sector information. The directive was adopted in 2003. It introduced a concept of reuse at the EU level. It also imposed some general conditions on reuse. But right now we see very clearly that this legislative framework is not enough any longer. Um, there is still lots of obstacles um, um, to reuse, there is still a lot of data hugging and uh, the revision of the PSI directive is about to tackle these obstacles. So currently we have few options on the table. We are considering such issues as changing of general principle that's making all accessible data reusable. We also think about move towards um, machine readability. Another issue is opening of um, data um, to sectors which are currently not covered by the directive. Another thing is pricing. Um, we think about imposing stricter rules on pricing because expensive data is not open data. But a decision on these options will be taken very soon, but by the end of of the year. Another point is deployment actions that we are thinking of. Um, so we will create a pan-European data portal. It will be created in two stages. First stage is the commission data portal, sometime early 2012. And at the later stage, at the second stage, after we see how this pilot commission portal works, we will go for the pan-European data portal. It will, be composed, it will be composed of data of the Commission and also data sets from other member states and from other institutions and bodies. Um, so, yes, we were inspired by the uh, UK portal, but what we want to create is on a very different scale, on the EU scale, basically. And um, the final point on the strategy is money. Um, the EU will support um, also financially research and innovation in the area. So far the issue is covered by the SIP program. It's for 2011 till 2013. But the new financial framework for the EU um, covering the period from 2014 till 2020 foresees a, a completely new chapter in the EU budget. It's called Connecting Europe Facility. La colonne vertébrale de l'Union Européenne. It will cover transport, energy and digital networks. So for the third uh, point, the digital networks, we think about some more than 9 billion euro for the period from 2014 till 2020. Thank you. Thank you, Donazina. Um, 
We have uh, a little less than five minutes left, so I will now ask very pointed, simple questions to the panel members, uh, and I will ask them to answer with one sentence. One sentence. Bernard, can you do that? Uh, I will start in the reverse order. Uh, Katarzyna, the idea of a single open data license for Europe, is that a good idea or a bad idea? Is that doable or not doable? I think it's doable, but it's too early to talk about it at that point, definitely. Okay, that's a good answer. Uh, um, Bruno, tell us about open data in Tunisia. Does it make sense? Um, it makes a lot of sense. Um, il y a certains partis en Tunisie, euh, donc la Tunisie va élire une assemblée constituante, euh, ont mis l'open data au cœur de leur proposition de constitution. C'est-à-dire qu'il est possible euh, que la Tunisie soit le premier pays à mettre dans la constitution l'open data, parce que pour eux c'est un formidable garde-fou euh, contre la corruption, qui est quand même massive. Merci. Uh, Romain, you're in charge of uh, innovation. Can you give us one example of an innovation we will see in the... Uh platform in December? That's a toughie. So, no, the... the uh, he was not warned of the question. Okay, so I'll try, I'll try to have one short sentence to answer this, but the, the uh, aim of Open Data is not uh, for government to innovate, it's really for government to be a platform uh, for innovation, and um, the true answer to that question is uh, turning to um, people from the digital economy who will be able to develop new applications based on that platform. And I think that's one sentence. Okay. Um, Fabien, uh, you, you've been working on applying, on, on applying uh, web, uh, semantic web technology to solve uh, open data problems. What is the, where do you think is the strongest difficulty you have to face to, uh, uh, in this application, in this use of this technology for that space? I'm, <clears throat> I think that one of the strongest difficulties right now that for many years people have been telling us where are the data, where are the data, where are the data. Now there are billions of data out there and people are saying, you know, what, how can I tackle a billion of data? How can I tackle a billion of data? So we, we just topple. And the scale, the uh, incompleteness, incoherencies, the changes of data on huge uh, data sets is uh, a problem uh, very, very difficult to tackle. Thank you. Uh, Bernard, do you think we can catch up with the rest of the world? If, One if, sentence. If I, if I didn't think so, I wouldn't <laughs> be here. Uh, not only we can catch up, we have to. It's, it's, it's not uh, an option. We, we have to because we cannot be in between Asia and California being the marketing courtyard between the two. We have to create and open data, mobile services are one of the avenue to create. Merci. Uh, Nigel, I won't ask you any question, just ask you to conclude. Huh. <laughs> hey, I got you uh, there. <laughs> uh, my life has been dominated by three letter acronyms just this last uh, a few days. I was in NYC uh, for the OGP. Uh, well, New York's a nice place. They've just launched a thing there called the Open Government Partnership. And it's interesting. Uh, you should see the countries involved. Um, but one of the planks of it are, is, is, is open data. And it's, the, the, the proposition is that to have really participatory democracy and engagement, you need certain sort of information to be out there. So it's kind of the lifeblood for a lot of open government work too. And I think that's really quite an exciting, uh, exciting vision. There are economic reasons, there are political reasons to get this uh, rock rolling. And I think what we're seeing is just a huge interest in the opportunities around open, open data. So I think, um, well, what can I say? C'est la l'occasion, I think. That's it. Merci. I would like to thank the audience and the speakers. Merci à vous.